All right, Power Athletes, welcome to episode 78 of Power Athlete Radio. I'm joined with John Luke, Cali Tex, and Steve Playtech. And our special guest today is Dr. Mauro Di Pasquale. If you don't know who Mauro is, he's basically one of the most influential voices on diet, performance, and athletic training in the world. I'm excited about this one. I know John and he have a have a great history together, so uh, let's just get the ball rolling. How, how are you doing today, Doc? Well, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. John. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I'll just give a little backstory, which we were before we hit the the start button. But I, I met Dr. Deepa Squally in 1999 uh, through my agent Ed Cunningham. Um, Doc has a you know pretty diverse supplement line and hooked me up with my first supplement deal. And so this big box of supplements comes up. It was everything from I think it was like Lipo Flush to you know whey protein and a, you know just a battery of boxes showed up and in the boxes were uh, a few books and one of those was or two or one was the anabolic diet and then the other one was the metabolic and as I started kind of going through and reading all the books and kind of started to look at this deal um, and kind of work with the supplements uh, Dr. De Pasquale put me in touch with Bob Sapp. Bob was kind of my you know, kind of go-to guy if I had any questions about anything or any tweaks. And you know, being an older guy in the NFL and playing down in Baltimore, he was right down the street. So that's actually how I met uh, Dr. D and also Bob Sapp was um, through this initial meeting. Uh, and then you know, I went in that rookie year, ended up getting hurt. And at that point, when I started rehabbing, is when I really sunk into the books and uh, really following this diet was really, or you know, uh, Doc's uh, you know dietary protocols with. You know, really pulling out the carbs and going to a high fat, high protein diet, and then kind of you know cycling back into different points. That really was my first experience with carb cycling, and really the first uh, person that I knew that you know was a big proponent of it. And this is how you kind of tweak it, and helped me end up. Um, I think I bulked up to like 336 pounds that year. Uh, benched you know five and a quarter for reps, squatted in the sevens, and was super strong. But unfortunately, I was just too big. And I remember hitting Doc up, "What do we do?" And we put some tweaks together, and Ended up uh, losing probably 25, 30 pounds in about three or four months and came in and played and played about 300, just over 305, 306 pounds for the rest of my NFL career and really kind of followed uh, those tweaks and really you guys will uh, start to understand that a lot of what we talk about on Power Athlete when I've talked about CrossFit football for the last five, six, seven years about, you know, diet and really, uh, you know, how to use fat, when to use carbs, how to kind of, you know, cycle them in and, you know, how protein plays such a key um, element in it was really started with uh, those books and really these initial conversations. So I'm stoked to have Mauro on and uh, be able to talk a little bit more and just hit him with some questions and figure out what he's doing and more importantly figure out uh, not only how to maximize performance, strength, and uh, look good naked, which is seems to be the, the blend we're looking for. I want to be real strong, I want to be real fast and real explosive, but I also want to look the part. So uh, I think nobody on the earth is better at that than tomorrow, so we're stoked to have him on, and thanks, Doc, and hopefully we can get rocking. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, you know, I first, uh, I first started, it, it, I've been in this for over half a century. You know, I started training when I was 13 years old, and I was using rebar uh, with concrete when I started training. And uh, it wasn't until I got to uh, university where I uh, majored in uh, genetics and molecular biochemistry that I really got into the insulin aspect. Uh, being at the University of Toronto, of course, uh, insulin was one of the things that uh, was big there because of uh, Dr. Bass and Banting. Um, so I got interested in the insulin aspect and, and then wondered, well, how can you manipulate it? How can you manipulate insulin in such a way that uh, you can maximize or help maximize performance and, and body composition? Interesting thing about insulin. That, that, I mean, you, know, you hear about leptin, you hear about G.H. Roman, you hear about uh, Iverson, you hear about all these various uh, compounds and, and hormones and, and growth factors, uh, cytokines and everything in the body. Um, but insulin, you can't do without it. You knock off insulin, you don't use it, you die. You knock off leptin, well, you know, so what? Uh, uh, same thing with most of the, even growth hormone. Um, changes take place, of course, but you're still alive. So insulin, insulin is a very crucial uh, hormone, and that's one of the reasons I was really interested in it right from the start. And part of the phase shift dieting that I, I came up with, uh, shifting the carbs and the fats, came because of manipulating insulin and using it to its, its best advantage. 
Well, uh, for those of you listeners that don't really, um, you know, haven't had time to rush to Google, really what Dr. D uh, <laughs> proposed to me and what he still puts out is a kind of an idea of like you go roughly 12 days uh, completely, you know, no carbs, so it's a ketogenic approach. And then you kind of do what's known as a cyclical keto diet where you'll, after those 12 days, you have a carb refeed. And then after those two-day carb refeeds, you'll go five days in a ketogenic state and then have a refeed. Um, the thing which is interesting with that refeed is you watch yourself over those five days, you know, lose water and you see yourself lean out. All of a sudden you see your, you know, carbs or uh, abs kind of pop up and you start feeling pretty vascular and feel, and on top of it feeling a little bit tired. And then all of a sudden you hit like, let's say for example, your first re recarb feed on that Saturday morning. And this always happens to me. And when I actually hit up Mauro to come on the podcast, I realized, you know what, uh, probably the best thing to do when we got into this was to not only go back to the anabolic diet, but, uh, you know, see how long. So I think I hit you up a couple months ago, and I've been on the anabolic for probably about three months. So I figured the best way uh, to have this podcast set up was actually to go back and kind of revisit some of the things I did and then have questions. But the best part is you hit that Saturday morning for your carb refeed, and I usually always either do it with some gluten-free pancakes or you know, uh, make those for the kids, and um, man, as I'm sitting there eating those pancakes, all of a sudden, like, sweat is dripping off me, and my wife always laughs, she's like, what is wrong with you, why are you sweating so bad, I'm like, I don't know, I'm so hot, so it's almost this, like, thermogenic effect just takes place, and then over the course, you eat a couple more carb-based meals, and you just watch kind of the bloat, and all of a sudden, your abs kind of disappear. That was, for me, always the uh, the trigger. As soon as uh, I stopped losing some definition in the stomach, I usually ended up cutting the uh, the carbs and going back to it. So for me, it was usually about 12 to 18 hours of carbs, but I know you promote as much as 48 hours of carbs. Well, it varies quite a bit. You know, it depends on, on your genetic makeup, epigenetic makeup, you know, what you're doing, et cetera. Some people can only carb up one meal. Some people can carb up for three days. And and, and the five-day, and five day, two-day was really a – it was just – it was just a starting point. Uh, it, w it was social, so to speak. In other words, you got five days where you know nobody really cares what you eat. You don't meet anybody hardly. You're at work or whatever you're doing. And then on the weekend, all of a sudden, you got people coming over, friends, etc. Uh, and, and they look at you kind of funny if you're not eating any carbs. So it, it started off as, as as a starting point. You know, after the first 12 days, for example, where you uh, go over to uh, primary fat burning as your primary fuel, then you start experimenting. Five day, two day, some, sometimes six day, one day, uh, sometimes three days uh, of, of, of strict carbs, and then one day of uh, carb loading, and then another three days of strict carbs. So it, it all depends on what works for you. And the beauty about all this was that you could actually experiment every week. Every week was like starting point, so to speak. You know, oh, what can I do that's different that I can make more progress? Well, the, the, the tweak that I ended up kind of working towards, you know, when I was playing in the NFL, I mean, obviously the, uh, you know, carbs being, you know, really our primary fuel for, you know, that type of deal, I was, uh, you know, ketogenic low carb on my off days. And then when the carbs, you know, or then when the uh, uh, training kicked back on, I used to ramp the fat down. And so the way I used to cycle it was based on my training days. So I knew that you know, post game after, uh, uh, you know, was going to be, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Tuesday being my day off, and really my carb days were Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then I, I, uh, I was keto on a Saturday, and then obviously carbed up on Sunday, so I really just kind of started mirroring, like, hey, you know what, uh, tomorrow's big, you know, going to be a big activity day, I need a, a lot of energy, I'm going to use carbs as that fuel, and it kind of started, I guess it really coined that kind of mindset that I, you know, preach all the time, which is earn your carbs. You know, if you're going out and you're busting your ass and you're training for three hours and you're running around on the field, lifting weights, doing all these different things, you know, you earned your carbs. If your workout looks like I sat on the couch and watched TV the whole day, you probably didn't earn any. So it kind of ended up kind of uh, rolling into that and, you know, really realizing that, you know, our bodies work very, very efficiently on fat and, uh, you know, protein obviously for body composition and carb and really how you tweak that carb is really based on that energy expenditure. Yeah, if, if you look at a, if you look at someone who's uh, become fat adapted, uh, and you look at the uh, an electron microscope of the of muscle cell, you'll see that there are fat droplets in the actual uh, skeletal muscle cell, and these fat droplets are right next to the mitochondrial membrane. I mean, they're touching, so that there's an easy transference of the fat into the mitochondria. Um, you don't see this as much in people who are who are carb. You don't see it hardly at all. People who are carb adapted, 
The other thing is that you know people that have these lipid droplets in skeletal muscle, uh, if they're not athletes, they're actually considered a pathological response. In other words, something that might lead to diabetes, for example. But with athletes, it's totally different. People, for example, coach people who are coach potatoes, so to speak, that go on uh, that develop these lipid droplets in the muscle cells are usually uh, insulin resistant. Athletes who develop them are insulin sensitive. So uh, a lot depends on what you do, how you do it, and, and what you're into. What about uh, what kind of uh, training would you most recommend? I mean, I know you did powerlifting, and you know we're a uh, you know highly competitive powerlifter. Uh, doing this kind of you know uh, you know fat adapted you know cyclical carb deal. Uh, what type of training? I'm sure you've tried everything. Um, you know, what kind of training did you see worked best not only for strength and for body composition? Was it, you know, uh, undulating periodization? Was it linear progression? Was it, you know, uh, you know, fasted morning cardio with, uh, you know, traditional bodybuilding? I mean, what kind of have you seen that, you know, worked best with this type of diet? Well, I, you know, as you know, we try everything. If you're serious about yeah. your theory, That's why I'm asking. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I did everything from working out heavy every single day, all three lifts, um, to uh, working out once every 10 days. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like an experiment. It depend, depends on your makeup and, and, and you know, how you're dieting, etc. I found that I did my best body composition and strength performance uh, uh, gains every 10, if I worked out really heavy every 10 days and then light every five days. And by heavy, I mean a four-hour workout. Where I'm lifting 90 to 100 tons, uh, I would go through the squat uh, up to single max. Then I'd go onto the bench up to single max. Then I'd lift up to single max. Then I'd go back to squat, um, and that would be every 10 days, heavy, usually a, a four-hour period. Um, and and I know everybody says nowadays, uh, 50 minutes is max, or an hour is max. Uh, you're not going to get any more progress. It's mm -hmm. total bullshit. Yeah, it depends what you're doing, how you're doing it. Recovery is so is so important, you know. Um, if if I found, for example, at the five day mark that uh, even though I was using light weights and just you know kind of just uh, getting my muscles uh, and, and everything in order to in order to recover better, if I felt weak, I might even extend that to twelve days. And if at the ten day mark I wasn't as strong or I didn't feel as good as the ten day mark beforehand, I cut back to work out make my recovery longer. So, you know, it, it, the thing I found when I worked out heavy every day, for example, uh, I got stronger up to a point and then I got weaker because no recovery. I did that for about uh, six weeks and that was, uh, you know, I just wanted to try it. Uh, and of course, I you know, went to the, the bodybuilding thing, you know, where you do upper body, lower body, you know, I did squats one day. Next day uh, I do deadlifts. The next day I do bench, and I take a day or two off, and then go through it again. You know, um, sure. you, know you, you really have to try what works best for you. As far as the diet aspect, it's the same way. Um, I found I I did the best on the ten days, and didn't carb load prior to working out. That worked for me. For other people, they felt too tired. They sure. would carb load maybe one or two days before, and then work out that heavy. So it really depends on trial and error, and I, and I stress that. I stress that in all my books. Find out what works best for you, trial and error. Try different things. And, and your body knows, you know. You know, after a couple of weeks or three or four weeks, whatever you do, um, if you're not making any progress or you're going backwards, you're doing something wrong. Sure. The, um, you know, uh, people always talk about how to, you know, uh, increase recovery, especially for the central nervous system, the carbs being a, a primary factor. I mean, static stretching, carbohydrate, rest, I mean, all these key factors. Do you find somebody that becomes uh, fat adapted, uh, you know, that their central nervous system doesn't recover as fast? Or do you think that that's just kind of one of those things you can kind of train into that obviously your central nervous system and, you know, that recovery really is going to uh, predicate on, you know, the demands you place it under? Um, you know, just a, a big thing we always run into with people that are doing the anabolic stuff is they feel so torched on by like Wednesday or Thursday that, you know, they're like the intensity is pretty good Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then by Thursday and Friday it really kind of tailors off, which almost kind of leads me to believe that the 
heavier workouts should probably be a little and you know a little earlier in the week with you know more light. I mean even you know dynamic speed stuff kind of a little later in the week. Yeah, I mean that that's true, and, and again it, it would depend on the individual. In my case, I found that uh, I did my best lifting uh, if I wasn't on any carbs for at least two or three days prior to it. So it depends. I mean, I used to like, when I was lifting competitively, um, I'd manipulate my weight. My, my my best class is 165 pound class. But I lifted from everything from 1, 132 to, uh, uh, to to 98 kilos to uh, to I, I wasn't even in the 220 pound class once. So you know I really manipulated uh, uh, my weight a lot. So it depended on uh, what what weight I was when I was training. But I always found that if I if I weighed in, for example, for 165 pound class, I weighed in at uh, 165 right on. Um, we only had a small amount of time uh, to get sort of weight back on here. Uh, I found that I could carb load and I'd be up to 175 by the time I started lifting two hours later. So, you know, I, I, really I, just did, uh, I, I did a funny deal on, uh, I think it was last week, I think I weighed in at like 288 on uh, on Friday and I carb loaded up on Saturday and I stepped on the scale Sunday Sunday morning at like, no, I was like two, I think I gained almost 13 pounds. So I was like uh, 280, 287 and stepped on at 300 pounds that next morning. And uh, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, like, like put on 10 pounds of water weight, like nothing. And it was like I woke up and even my eyelids felt swollen. I was like, that was probably too much carb. That's interesting. Actually, a lot of people find that the, uh, uh, when they carb up, if they wait a couple of days, they actually look the best. You know, it's oh. two days after. Um, they seem to have lost that uh, that excess water, and uh, they're starting to lean out more. And they find that uh, the body composition is the best at that time. I mean, I remember lifting once uh, in 148 pound class. I weighed in at 148, did the lifting. Uh, two days later, I was 165. Wow. So, is it is it safe to say that uh, you know, at the end of the day, calories in, calories out? That the easiest way to manipulate your weight with this is just Hey, you know what? Like, I know that you know the standard. You know, reduce the calories by 500 to 1,000 a day, and over the course of a week, you're going to lose you know one to two pounds, which is about right. Is would you say that's fairly fairly accurate on this type of diet, or is that you know too traditional in terms of bodybuilding thinking? Not really. I don't think it's too traditional. I mean, this is something that's been done for decades. I mean, bodybuilders, you know, when they were uh, getting ready for competition, uh, Larry Scott, you know, the old time bodybuilders, uh, Dave Draper. Uh, even Schwarzenegger and stuff, they wouldn't lose their weight all at once. They they cut down over a longer period of time, keeping the skeletal muscle mass as much as they could, and losing more of the body fat. And this is the way to do it, of course. I mean, uh, rapid weight loss. When I did my rapid weight loss, a lot of it was fluid weight, um, and 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 of course, depleting the carbs would decrease the fluid even more. And then when I did re you know sort of recarb, I would gain that weight back very fast. Huh. So what uh, what what do you think would be ideal in terms of like uh, conditioning? I mean, you know, is it a uh, uh, you know fasted type cardio or more like a like a hit type stuff for conditioning? Um, you know, because I know that you know when we tried to do some you know more hit type training, especially in that kind of carb depleted uh, you know progression, like a, let's say a Tuesday Thursday, even today we did a you know probably twenty minute little circuit and dude. Uh, you know, all of a sudden your head starts ringing, your body starts screaming. So you start looking at, you know, obviously the the higher the intensity and, you know, even like let's say something similar to a CrossFit, anybody that we've seen that's done, you know, CrossFit type training on a keto diet just ends up just imploding. And uh, so it just kind of makes me realize either you got to be super fat adapted or you just got to be smart with the intensity. I think you got to do both. You know, I mean, super fat adaptation is, uh, is, is a really good thing because, with this kind of diet, when you go on the carbs, you're building up glycogen as well. So what you've got is you've got the glycogen granules in the muscle cells. You also have the uh, the uh, lipid droplets, fat droplets there as well. Using that as a primary fuel when needed be, ideally, you should be able to switch over and use the glycolytic response where it goes from uh, uh, either glycogen or, or glucose down into uh, pyruvate lactic acid and generating some a minimum amount of ATP and, uh, under anaerobic conditions. This is this is the ideal. So when you need it, you use it. You've got it. But when you don't need it, 
you've got the, you've got the fat that uh, that you're burning primarily. This this would be sort of the ideal athletic conditioning, both for competition and for uh, body composition, performance, etc. It's something that you have to work at to see what days you can and can't go low carb, and what days you need to carb up, and how your and how it relates to your performance. And again, because this is a weekly thing, you can really fine tune it. But you know, obviously, obviously, you have to put effort into it. So uh, usually. You know, the other big one I always get when people ask me about it is, um, you know, like obviously with the carb refeeds, like let's say you do, uh, you know, like let's say it's like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then all of a sudden you're going to recarb on Thursday. Is it better to recarb after almost like a fasted period? Like uh, I'm going to go to bed and be fasted. I'm going to wake up and carb it up opposed from, hey, I'm going to eat keto, keto, and then all of a sudden later in the day start getting that carb meal. Because I, I think somebody recently was like, oh, well, what if I start my carb on a Friday night? Is that any problem having eaten keto a course of that day and then all of a sudden eating a carb? And I was like, you know what? That's a good question. You'd ask Dr. D about it. But I always remember something about the carb refeed coinciding with that fasted state. Yeah, you're basically talking about overcompensation. Yeah. You, drop, you, drop, you drop the carbs uh, really low um, to the point where you uh, you deplete your glycogen reserves. Uh, you really have nothing left as far as the glycolytic response, um, and you're running everything through the, uh, the Krebs cycle, which would be you know through your fats and, and protein. Um, then your body is so starved, the thing is that uh, it'll pick up carbs much faster. This is this is the whole business of what after workouts, where you know you, you take protein and carbs together, which which I feel is a mistake, by the way. Oh, really? So, so you feel that like the most advantageous diet would be just a pure protein diet post workout? Well, post workout, okay. You know this. Yeah, I don't want to get in too complicated, but but basically, Please get as complicated as you want. If there's people right. on here that can't follow us, then you know what they need to go back and re-listen to it. And uh, because <laughs> for me, I mean, dude, uh, Doc, I love the minutia of this stuff. So please get as detailed as you want. All right. Well, take a look at insulin, for example. Insulin is composed, it's a storage hormone, right? So people say, okay, it's a storage hormone. So you're going to store glycogen, you're going to store fat, and you're going to store protein. The mistake most people make is that it does all three at the same time, whereas it, it can be individualized. In other words, you can store carbs, and this will shut off the insulin response, or you can start burning fats, storing fats, or you can start uh, storing protein. Now, for example, after a workout, uh, if you don't give your body carbs, then the glycogen repletion occurs over a longer period of time. So this longer period of time keeps your insulin sensitivity for building muscle mass because the insulin sensitivity and, and resistance will depend on how many carbs you take in, and how many carbs you're able to store all at once. So I'll give you an example. I work, I do a heavy, heavy duty workout, and what I do is I eat 500 grams of carbs all at once. Well, within an hour, you're 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 carved up, you're super compensated, etc. Your insulin resistance goes up dramatically, and that means basically that uh, you're not really building any muscle protein. If you prolong that, keep the insulin sensitivity up, then over a period of let's say even four, six, eight, ten, even 24 hours, you can actually build on the uh, increasing the amino acid synthesis, increasing uh, the accretion of muscle, while still keeping uh, glycogen levels below a level where it would shut off the insulin effect on the uh, on protein. So, so something like a post-workout meal, like pure protein, would be a, probably obviously advantageous, seeing as we know that fat slows absorption out of the stomach, so you'd obviously want that to hit. So something like a, a simple protein, and I'm, I'm trying to recall like 15 years ago the conversation, especially when you sent me all the supplements, like hitting those uh, shaker bottles that you had, you were like, I want you to hit 50 grams of protein immediately after your workout, and I don't want you to hit any fat until you know that post-workout meal. Was that about right? That's about right because what happens is post workout your body your body tends to utilize fat as an energy source um, primarily because it wants to to increase the glycogen content it wants to get you wants to get your body back to where you have uh, you know overcompensate as far as the glycogen levels and also uh, you know keeping the uh, positive amino acid uh, uh, 
positive synthesis, protein synthesis. Um, this, this is a natural response. Unfortunately, with insulin, um, once you've supercompensated the, uh, the, the, the glucose, it actually also decreases protein synthesis. So you're not, you're not, you're, and also insulin is considered anti-catabolic. So you're not using your protein as, as an energy source um, to build up your uh, to build up your uh, glycogen levels. You, have to, you know, it, it, this is not this hasn't been, as far as the research goes. This stuff has not been all worked out. I mean, you know, you talk to people about anything, leptin. You talk to them about testosterone. You talk to them about the irisin and, and the various other uh, growth factors and other cytokines, etc that affect the body, you know, we're still in an infantile stage. I mean, every new study you read tends to either contradict what's already been there or add a bit of information that's there and take away some information. So you really have to be careful. And this is why you got to listen to your body. This is why you got to sort of experiment and see. Uh, try, for example, after a workout, strictly going on a, on a, on a high protein. You want the calories. You want to go on a high protein diet. As far as the fat, the fat really doesn't interfere as much as I thought it did back then. Now you don't want to overdo the fat of course because you want your body to use uh, the body fat as an energy source and use that to produce uh, uh, to increase protein uh, levels in the body, increase uh, mu muscle, uh, uh, the anabolic response to muscle. Um, so really it's a matter of trying it out, you know. Keep off carbs for example, let's say for four hours and then go and then, and then carb off and see how it affects your body post workout after three or four weeks. You know, how, how is it? Are you stronger? Is your body composition improving, etc.? If it's not, then bury the times. Yeah, I, I recently did a deal where I went and trained. I mean, we did a, a ton of pulling, punch a you know just a bunch of posterior chain work. Like I had a heavy deadlift day on a Saturday, and then uh, you know Saturday usually obviously being my carb day, and I. Uh, Decided, I was like, you know what, I'm going to fast and wait like four hours before I carb up. And uh, when we went, I actually went back and consumed a whole bunch. I was sore for like the next like six days. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, and I haven't been sore, like had muscle soreness since I was probably 15, 16 years old like this. And I, I just laughed and I was like, all right, so that's me telling my body I need to eat immediately after. And so, you know, like that's why I was like, okay, you know what, I'm just going to pound a shake and do something that's real quick acting. And uh, and then obviously in that post-workout post meal, that second meal, I'll end up kind of up in the fat a little bit. But it's it seems like a relatively easy thing. And uh, I remember uh, when I, I remember years ago talking to you about it and I was like, well, Doc, how am I going to get all this fat? And you were like, I just want you to drink olive oil. Go get a shot glass and I want you to knock back the olive oil. And I remember sitting at a restaurant and pulling out a glass and drinking olive oil and the look on people's faces. And I've recommended it people ever since. And I'm like, just get a shot glass, put an ounce of olive oil. You're probably going to get about, you know, uh, you know, a couple, th you know, a thousand plus grams of, uh, of, pro or of, of fat in there. And it just, how you knock it out. But in terms of, uh, really fats, I mean, the ideal fat, and I know the one that you know, we first talked about was saturated fat being the most important, especially for a healthy androgen profile. You know, you want to have a you know, good testosterone levels. So you want to be able to you know, recover and get stronger. You've got to be saturated fat in, in the diet, and the problem is, is saturated fat's been so vilified for so long that it, you know, thank God it's starting to make a little bit of a comeback, but uh, you, you take us through a little bit on terms of like the most ideal fat sources. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Research on fats contradictory. You know, you get some research. Some recent research has come out that uh, saturated fat doesn't uh, doesn't affect uh, cholesterol levels. Uh, other research shows that it does. You know, to me, research is to be taken with a grain of salt uh, until there's a lot of evidence that it's going in a certain direction. Um, I, I really, I really, I'm I'm really abhorred by, for example. Um, Research that comes out, and all of a sudden, all all the all the uh, TV brings it out, magazines. It's on all the internet sites, and all of a sudden, people say, "Okay, bananas are going to increase your bicep size by one inch." So everybody starts eating bananas. Um, the whole thing is 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 not taken in context. I so I have a problem with all these uh, all these. Oh, what can I say? It's almost like entertainment nowadays, you know. You come up with these studies and, and, and they broadcast it and everybody looks at it and says, okay, I'm going to change this in my diet. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it this way or that way. Uh, and then next week something else comes along that says, well, maybe you shouldn't do that because you're going to have a heart attack. And so they stop doing it. Um, you, need a, you need context. And what I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be starting up my newsletter again. What I'm going to try and do is 
look at some of these studies, put it in context, and extrapolate as to what they actually mean. That's crazy talk. So then, so let's <laughs> let's let's build some context. Let's say let's put together just a, a brief for our our listeners, yeah, our, I mean, our followers, so, our lifting weights. Well, so so for most people, especially when they get into it, and I always get a big one like you know what's probably the most ideal fat source. And so what I always like to do is uh, you know obviously saturated fat from you know animal sources and uh, you know medium chain omegas or uh, like like medium chain triglycerides like uh, you know coconut oil and then obviously monosaturated. Or uh, monounsaturated fats like olive oil, avocado oil, and different kind of uh, uh, oils like that. So I mean, you know, avocados kind of fit in there, and olives. So I mean, I really talk about uh, you know those being probably your best fats choices that are available to you, opposed from you know trans fats or polyunsaturated or all these different ones. So I mean, that's yeah, I mean, I mean, you're, you're right to a large extent, but as far as the diet's concerned, you're better off sticking to long chain fatty acids. The problem with the medium chain and short chain fatty acids is that they're uh, first of all they don't need uh, the the they don't need a process to get into the mitochondria. They're they're, they're brought into the mitochondria. They're used almost like uh, glucose as far as a as a food source. Um, that, that's one of the problems, for example, with with fiber. Uh, when you take fiber and and, and some of the uh, um, some of the uh, starches that are resistant. To uh, digestion is that you get the uh, bacteria forming short chain fatty acids in the colon, and short chain fatty acids actually uh, provide an energy source. So people who say, "Okay, this 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 food contains uh, 27 grams of, uh, of of carbs, but 26 grams is fiber," and they think, "Okay, we're home free. It's only got one gram of sugar or whatever." That's not true. You, you, know, you have to count in the short chain fatty acids that are produced, etc. The problem, the problem with the short chain fatty acids and the medium chain fatty acids is that they actually short circuit your use of the long chain fatty acids, which from body fat. So yeah, you're actually uh, can say that you're actually using carbs when you're using the medium and short chain fatty acids. Uh, that's, so what would, that's be the, the what would be the best long chain fatty acids then? Well, um, like I said, mon monosaturated. Um, like olive oil, I eat, and, and people get the wrong idea about meats. For example, pork has a lot of monosaturated uh, fatty acids in it. Um, the um, omega threes, obviously, um, people get enough of the omega six, but you can mix that in as well. Flaxseed oil, etc. This combination, hemp oil. There, there's all kinds of oils that are good, but even even foods, you know, your your, your saturated fatty acids from cheeses. Um, and a recent study has shown, in fact, that uh, the dairy saturated fatty acids uh, have a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular system. And people, you know, obviously think, uh, you know, saturated fats, you know, you're going to develop high cholesterol, uh, high LDLs, uh, and uh, cardiovascular uh, problems will ensue. That's not necessarily the case. There's still a lot of research that has to go on. But I think, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we're getting a little more solid information on why saturated fats aren't as bad and not as vilified as they were for the last 34 years. So something like a, like, you know, uh, you know, like a raw cheese or a hard cheese would obviously be better, you know, better seeing as that, you know, the fermentation process or the, uh, the cheese, uh, you know, making it a cheese, the lactose is blunted. So therefore, you know, if you ever look at, you know, nice raw cheese, it's usually pretty high in fat and that's always a pretty good pro uh, fat source. So, I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing, and I'm sure you run into this more than, than you, uh, uh, than this type of stuff where people actually want to know the nuts and bolts. Most people are like, well, just tell me, uh, tell me what to eat. I, I believe you. You're smarter than me. Uh, you know, what's the best way to kind of jump into this? And um, I always say, you know, like the, for people that have never done, you know, kind of a ketogenic diet, I always think that has uh, some, some, some real good deals. And especially that first 12 days, uh, things get pretty dicey. I mean, it's always interesting seeing people break from that kind of carb addiction. I have a client right now, a guy who, uh, you know, we've been, you know, the reason I kind of started when I started this keto deal recently, uh, when I hit you up, I said, I mean, I want you to do this ketogenic diet and this is how it fits. And uh, I started on it and he hasn't. And uh, still every day I'm like, how's it going? He's like, oh, I just can't start it. He's like, I can't get away from the carbs. And it just makes me realize how powerful uh, carbohydrate is. It's not only in terms of performance, but mentally. I mean, that's just the toughest thing where you're just like, you know, hey, I don't want you to eat this. And they just, you know, it calls to me. I wake up in the middle of the night. And it's, oh, my God, it's crazy. 
Yeah. You know, you know, something you have to consider is that you know people think of DNA and they think of your you know your your makeup DNA makeup. I call that being hardwired. Okay, in other words, you're set with a certain set of chromosomes, uh, a certain DNA makeup that uh, that you can work with. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you're going to end up being. In other words, anybody can become fat adapted, but if their hard wiring limits their fat adaptability, they're going to run into some problems. They will become fat adapted to a certain extent, but they will require more carbs. Other people, for example, can go on uh, a low carb diet forever because again their hard wiring uh, is such that uh, and I talked about the epigenetic aspect and what that does is it quietens some genes and activates other genes so that they have the genes to activate when they go on the uh, on, on, a, on the ketogenic aspect of the, of the diet at the low carb phase and they do really well. Another person may be hardwired DNA wise so that they have a limited potential for uh, bringing up the enzymes and 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 the, the cytokines, hormones, etc., that are needed to be successful in that. So they're going to be partially successful. This is why, you know, when I wrote the metabolic diet, I had people start off in two phases. They could start with cutting back on their carbs first of all by 25% as a beginning phase, uh, or starting off with 12-day really low carb and going on that way. You know, uh, the people who can't take 12-day best thing for them to do is to cut back on the carbs and, and 25 percent is reasonable it's not going to affect them that much and then over time increase it to a point where they're comfortable and not running into problems so this 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 would uh, this would allow them to make the best use of the hardwiring DNA that, you know, sort of that, they're, that they're born with uh, with the changes that will take place when that have to take place for the diet to be effective for them at whatever level they arrive at so basically owning a set of measuring spoons and a couple measuring cups and a scale becomes almost, uh, you know, super important. And, you know, anybody that comes to me and wants actually, hey, you know, I need to gain weight, lose weight. First thing I do is I'm like, you know what, I need you to write me a, you know, a food journal. I need to know how much you're eating because most people are uh, either chronic under eaters and then a massive binger. And I'm sure you've seen this. It's like, oh, you know what, I ate really well. And then all of a sudden I'm super hungry. So then they go binge and it's like, well, you ate roughly 1,500 calories between 8 a.m. and 6 o'clock at night, and then 8 o'clock at night you ate 3,000 calories. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of interesting that, like, you know, uh, Luke's smiling because that's him. That's me. Yeah, that's Luke. He, uh, you know, that idea, like, hey, I'm working, I don't have time, and then all of a sudden you get home and you crush it. But, you know, it, it works for some people, but, you know, the idea of, like, you know, constantly fueling, you know, every eating every three hours, which, you know, it's funny, uh, I'm always amazed sometimes that people forget all the good stuff that we know that, you know, and uh, I always, when we ever go teach seminars, I always joke and whenever people ask me about body composition and I'm like, you know, you realize bodybuilders have been getting in shape with uh, body, uh, body part splits, uh, fasted cardio, uh, weighing and measuring their food and, uh, you know, low endurance, you know, aerobic, you know, type stuff on, uh, in a fasted state for the last, I don't know, what, 50, 60 years. So oh, yeah. you know, if the only you know if your only goal is body composition, then you know what there's uh, you, you don't have to go out and torture yourself and kill yourself and do a lot of things. I mean, there's you know some very very easy parameters. It's about uh, you know caloric restriction and really managing that whole deal and uh, you know and consistency. I mean, you know, people always ask me what's the secret to everything. I'm like consistency. Everybody can do it for two or three days, but can you do it for six months? Do you have the time to put in you know 14 weeks to be able to lose 30 pounds of fat? It's important to keep a journal. I mean, not only for the not only for the diet, but for the training. I mean, when I trained, when I was competitive, uh, I kept a journal of every single workout, every single rep, every single weight, and and then also kept uh, a journal for what I ate, when I ate it, etc. And uh, I can go back and I can see my progress on certain training regimens and lack of progress in other ones. And same thing with the diet. Now, consistency. Is really really important because if you're not consistent, you don't know where the hell you are. You know, you're all over the map, and uh, there's no way you can improve because you don't know what you've done that did that caused any improvement or loss of uh, performance or loss of body composition. So yeah, both are, you know, they're really important. 
So the, and it, it, it's a scale, uh, you know, a key factor. I mean, you know, I've always heard people be like, oh, you know what, you don't need a scale, just go by and look in the mirror. And I'm like, you know what, if if you don't have a scale and you're not able to at least weigh yourself twice a week, you know, every three or four days and weigh yourself before and after if you do the kind of the anabolic stuff and you don't know if the scale's going up or down and you're just going off of looks, I'm like, that's a scary deal. So, I mean, the idea of going in and weighing yourself and seeing how different things affect you and then, you know, keeping a, a you know, pretty detailed example, I mean, it's got to be, uh, you know, it, it's got to be pretty meticulous. So. But, I mean, I guess talking about context, <laughs> someone who's just finding their new fitness and training life, like, uh, you know, we, we talk about it at the seminar, like baby steps. Sure. Uh, it, unless you are that type of individual who really w likes to get into the minutia and granularity of exactly what you're doing, uh, sometimes sometimes the best approach, that's overwhelming for people. The best approach is our other side of it, John, which is just, yeah, do take a look in the mirror. Are you looking good? Are you showing up? And are, do, are you doing more than yesterday? Sure. And eventually, that's not going to be enough, and they're going to want more. And then sure. that's when you start to really dial in, and let's start to track some things, tinker, uh, and then get the scale out, start measuring weighing food, but like we get all the time at the seminar, what's, your, what's, what's the magic supplement stack for me? It's like, well, what's your diet look like first? I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't really pay attention to that. I just want the supplements. Well, that, that's actually a good segue. Uh, Doc, um, in terms of supplements, uh, what would you recommend for, you know, people trying to gain strength? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, you probably have been in the supplement game longer than, you know, uh, than any of us have been in here lifting weights. I mean, so it's, uh, uh, you know, what kind of things do, are, are, you know, do you think are really the, the difference? And, you know, I mean, obviously supplements aren't going to be the 90%. They're more like the 10%. But, you know, for people looking to maximize that 10%, what do you recommend? 10% is huge. I mean, you figure the Olympic sports, 0.01% can be huge. As far as the, uh, you know, the, uh, the gold medal winner and the person who also ran. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to me to give advice to people when they don't really know themselves. You know, they, they and, and they're not serious. When you're talking about scales, for example, you know, you were talking about weighing, and then uh, I think it was uh, Luke that mentioned uh, weighing your food as well. Yeah, yeah. You go, this is the baby step thing. You know, as as you as you progress and as you get more serious and start achieving some goals, you do have to do more. So at first you may only put down, well, okay, I trained Wednesday, did uh, three sets of squats, three sets of benches, three sets of deadlifts. Thursday I did this, and Wednesday I did that. The next step would be to actually put down the weights and everything that you've done. The next step would be you know, to start doing your diet. Then you start weighing your food, depending on what body composition you want to achieve, how much weight you want to gain, where you want to be, et cetera. So it's a progression. Uh, it's a progression. Um, and doesn't obviously not linear progression because linear progression only works for a period of time. After a while, you have to change. You have to see, you know, what kind of periodization works best for you. You know, when to take your rest, when when to go off the diet, for example. Um, you, you know, go off and, and go on a, on a on a normal North American deadly diet, uh, and then go back on again. So, it, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of lot of information that you can gather about yourself, and the more serious you are. The more information you gather, the more you're going to improve because you're going to know what works and what doesn't work. Now, I lost uh, saying all that. I think I, I, I lost the original question. <laughs> oh, uh, we were talking about supplements. So yeah, I mean, but but that's a, I, I, hey, all this yeah. stuff is solid gold. So you're happy to go off on any tangents. But like, what type yeah. of supplements? I mean, obviously, like something like uh, you know, like uh, you know, post workout, like a, a protein supplement or you know, creatine. And I know you have. You know, if you click on Morrow's site, uh, you know, which we'll post a link to, you know, he's got a battery of supplements. So, I mean, obviously, like, is there? I mean, there, there's things out of the peripheral, but what would you consider those kind of core things that you know, athletes would need in their uh, in their supplement regimen? Well, what I try and do is I try and put supplements to the best use. So you're going to have supplements uh, that you may want to use in the morning, and uh, afternoon, and evening. Some supplements you might, may want to use before bed. Obviously, supplements before training. And after training and during training, important too. So you have to look at what, and, and it's complex. Uh, for example, post-training supplements. I usually recommend people stay off carbs for a while. Uh, they use uh, something which will boost their their growth hormone levels. Uh, I have a I have a supplement called GH Boost. Uh, I also use a, an amino acid, 
a very concentrated branched chain amino acid plus much, much, much more to take with the GH boost. Uh, and then an hour later, after right after you train, I, I recommend that uh, you take a certain number of supplements. And then an hour later or something, you have your, your meal, which could be a steak, could be, you know, whatever it is, and depending on when you're going to have your carb intake. So uh, pre-training, you want something that's going to prime you for the actual uh, uh, for the actual training session, and I tell people not to take any carbs prior to training, uh, to use something that will provide them with certain amino acids and certain vitamins and certain minerals that they're going to use, and then also supplements while you're training. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, if, you, if you take a, a, a milk protein, for example, um, whey, whey protein, if you take whey protein before you train, let's say uh, an hour before you train, half an hour before you train, you load up on the whey protein. Well, whey protein, when it's not used, tends to be uh, converted so that you're actually increasing your carb intake. People don't realize this. Um, so that's somewhat counterproductive as far as increasing growth hormone and some of the other hormones while you're training. Now, while you're training, on the other hand, as against before training, Whey protein is not a bad idea because your body then uses the protein as an antiparotic substance. In other words, something which will increase the flux of the uh, uh, Krebs cycle. I, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, and, and this produces a, this, this increases the energy levels and produces ATP. So, uh, and then whey protein after training again is counterproductive. And people people think whey protein is the greatest thing in the world. It is when it's used properly. But not before and after training. And a lot of people use whey protein large amounts so right after training. And this actually blunts the insulin response to muscle accretion over a longer period of time. So if whey so if you switch the whey protein to the you know kind of peri uh, you know uh, nutrition deal, what would be obviously the best meal or supplement or whatnot? Like what would you recommend, let's say, uh, pre training an hour before? Well, you know, anything at all. Uh, as long as it's uh, fairly high in protein and it's complex protein, casein is good protein. Uh, it uh, uh, breaks down over a longer period of time. Um, doesn't uh, uh, translate as easily into the uh, gluconeogenesis, which is production of glucose from uh, from uh, a fast-acting protein. Uh, I have an article on the site about the different proteins, and uh, there's fast proteins and there's and there's slow proteins. Um, Using a fast protein at the right time is, is fine while you're training. Uh, if you use a fast protein after you train, and especially if you combine it with carbohydrates, uh, it, it short circuits. Oops, I don't know if I'm just going to shut that off. I'll be back in just two seconds. Sorry about that. There's a school board calling, and my wife is taking that. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. I said you're an important man. So yeah. No. Okay. So we're talking about fast acting spurs or slow acting proteins. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, it, it's like, um, <laughs> and, and I hate to say this, but people that use a, a fast acting protein right after working out, and and especially if they combine it with carbs, it's like uh, somebody who has a premature ejaculation. It's all over with too fast, and. Uh, what you want is you want a prolonged uh, time period in which your muscles uh, can recover and also, more importantly, gain in muscle mass. And this is this again is why the emphasis is on insulin. Insulin affects all the other hormones as well. Leptin, GH relin, and all all the other ones are affected by insulin. It's the hub, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'm doing some in-depth articles on that as well. But um, so using the right supplement at the right time is really important. Like. I recommend people, for example, if they're not training, if they're not in a training day, they use the GH boost and testicle boost, which will increase uh, growth hormone levels and testosterone levels prior to going to bed and no other time. Otherwise, I have them take it before and after training. Hmm. So would, uh, what would be like a, like a, you know, would something like a, you know, eating a couple hard-boiled eggs before, before training be advantageous? Yeah, it would be, sure it would. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, uh, even meat, anything at all. Uh, no carbs. 
the, the uh, proteins from the whole foods will, uh, will last quite a while, takes quite a while to digest, and won't give you a flood of, uh, of, uh, of uh, amino acids prior to your training session. And then post workout, would you say uh, immediately after, like similar type deal, like uh, something like a uh, meat eggs deal? Uh, would you, uh, you know, would that be like immediately after? Would that be, you know, the type of deal where maybe you want to like once you get done training, would it be within 15 minutes? Would it be be within an hour? Well, it depends how hard you train. <laughs> if you train like I trained back then, four hours, in the four hours, man, you can choke down some, some amino tablets and uh, and some water. And otherwise, you up chuck. Yeah. Uh, so you got to wait, you know, until until you're ready for it. But I always had, I would, I always took the uh, some quick acting, uh, not quick acting, sorry, so it's branch chain amino acids along with some of the individual amino acids like glutamine stuff like that after I trained uh, to a certain extent, and then when I could eat, I would go on to the protein. But you usually keep the fat, like uh, the you know the extra fat, pretty low in that meal because obviously you want to kind of speed up absorption, I guess, a little bit, and then try to really backload and start eating kind of maybe a little bit lower protein, a little higher fat later in the day. Interestingly enough, once you're fat adapted, and there's a study on this, um, taking protein and fat together actually doesn't affect the absorption of protein all that much. It's something people really don't know. Uh, this oh. is that was done back in. Uh, and I can, I can send it to you if you remind me. Yeah, yeah, please do because I, I was always under the absor uh, under the impression that you know adding fat into that post workout meal just slowed absorption too much. I mean, obviously taking anywhere from you know 45 minutes to an hour for you know food sources to really get through the whole digestive situation where they get to the small intestine and really launch out. So I always thought about you know fat slowing absorption out of the stomach and, you know, slowing it into the, the uh, small intestine. So I was always under the impression that, you know, hey, I need to get this stuff in. I need to chew my food really well so that the digestion uh, has as much, I guess, the digestion process is streamlined as, as uh, most important. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that's, that's a valid concern. There's no doubt about that. But, uh, when you're fat adapted, your body seems to have changed. Again, you know, we're looking at the epi epigenetics that changed the environment so that, it actually separates out fat and the protein and will differentially uh, absorb uh, without having any real effect on the absorption of the, of the other macronutrients. So uh, how, like for the listeners, I mean, obviously I'm, I know what, what it feels like to be fat adapted, but uh, what would you say they are like key signals that you're becoming fat adapted? I mean, obviously, you know, the uh, we always joke that the uh, the keto breath where you know, you feel like uh, you haven't brushed your teeth in about 30 days, which uh, people always ask me, like, well, how do you know you're in a ketogenic state? I'm like, when all of a sudden you kind of go, you know, kind of take your uh, uh, tongue over your teeth and you think to yourself, oh, I'll brush my teeth this month. But uh, what other things would you say in terms of fat adapted? Well, I think, I think the, you know, going through a, a period of time, I mean, actually, true fat ad adaptation takes a while. Uh, there have been studies that have been done that, even after three or four days, your body uh, has changed some of the enzyme systems, et cetera, so that you're more proficient in using fat. Um, the 12 day period gives you a start. It's not, you're not fully fat adapted after the 12 day period. Then you have to go through the cycling that you go through. When you're taking the carbs after being uh, the first 12 days, uh, you're still preferentially using uh, fats as your primary fuel, but not, not as efficiently as you are a couple months down the line, for example. So how many? So what would you say? Like about a three or four month, uh, obviously cycle of doing this, then you start reaching that fat adaptation. Yeah, I mean for fully fat adaptation, to really feel the effects where you're able to use both the glycogen and the lipid molecules in muscle tissue as energy sources when needed, you need more, much more than, than just a few weeks. Uh, I'd say probably minimum of three months. Oh. Wow. That be... At that stage. You, you will be more proficient as far as performance because your body will be able to use the, the glycogen granules when they're really needed. And also, interesting thing, you know, most people say, for example, after 70% PO2 uh, max, uh, your body has to use glycogen in order to produce ATP because you don't have enough oxygen to go through the uh, Krebs cycle and, and produce the oxidative phosphorylation, etc., uh, in yep. order to produce ATP. But in fact, once you're fat adapted and, and you're really in, into it, you can go as high as 85%. Mm -hmm. 
So there's, there's very little need, unless you're really going all out, uh, for the glycogen, which, if things work out right, and again, if your hardwiring allows it, that you'll be most proficient. And what about like like lactic acid threshold training? I mean, I know having been in a deep, deep keto state and all of a sudden, you know, hitting my body and doing a, some lactic acid threshold stuff, I mean, actually, you know, makes you almost want to throw up and kind of makes you sick a little bit. Uh, which, you know, what's kind of the idea really there and why would lactic acid kind of cause that nauseated response? Well, actually, you know, people, people misjudge lactate. Lactate is a very important uh, uh, compound. Uh, lactic acid, of course, is produced when you don't have enough oxygen to go through. Uh, you know, you're using your glycogen, glucose, and then down to pyruvate. Ordinarily, with enough oxygen, the pyruvate goes into the uh, Krebs cycle, produces huge amounts of ATP uh, as an energy source. When you don't have the oxygen available, it's shunted over to lactic acid. Lactic acid is moved out of the uh, out of the muscle tissue uh, as efficiently as can be done. Um, and it's converted to glucose in the liver through gluconeogenesis. So, and it's it's like a cycle, you know, you go through, uh, and, and there's various cycles going on. You know, there's the alanine cycle produces glucose as well, uh, and also produces uh, uh, alpha ketoglutarate to uh, uh, pump up the Krebs cycle to keep the flux going. Uh, this is fairly complicated stuff, but you know, lactic acid threshold basically will increase when you're really fat adapted. In other words, you'll be able to use more, you'll be able to shunt more of, 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 of the, of the uh, substrates, especially fat, through the Krebs cycle and produce larger amounts of ATP than if you weren't fat adapted. If you're not fat adapted, you're going to hit the lactic acid threshold because at that point, you're running out of ATP. You're only producing two ATP, four ATP, depending on how, you know, which, which, which way it goes. When you produce lactic acid, you're producing uh, eight to nine times as much when you're able to utilize it and take it right through to oxygen and uh, and water uh, through the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. So by becoming, by sticking to the diet, and again, depending on your hard wiring, uh, as to the ability whether or not you'll be sticking to it as well. I'd say probably you're running maybe 50 to 60 percent of the people that can do really well if they stick to the diet for about a three-month period. And at that point, their performance and everything should improve, and they'll be able to utilize both of the substrates, both the fat and the glycogen, whenever needed. And they'll have less need of the glycogen at that point. Uh, people that are hardwired, and, and in the sense that they don't have the ability, whether or not epigenetics is present or not, uh, will have a hard time not having more carbs and, and, and the maximizing performance. So really, this is something you have to play with. Is... Uh... So is the carb refeed? I mean, obviously, you know, uh, like how does that really play into it? I mean, if, uh, you know, you're hardwired and you can perform and uh, really be able to push the, you know, the intensity, the volume of your training once you're keto and or more importantly fat adapted, uh, you know, how did the, you know, in that state, what is really the, uh, you know, the super benefit? I mean, you talk about like, you know, almost a super compensation or, you know, all of a sudden you're in this state and then all of a sudden you kind of shut all the, uh, you know, high amounts of carbs. I mean, it's going to boost insulin levels. And is the, is the effect of that carb, I mean, is that really where the muscle building takes place? I mean, is that really the effect and, and how does that kind of play into it? Well, I mean, again, again, with, with the, uh, if your muscle cells contain both fat and carbs, and this is the glycogen granules and, and, the, and the fat the lipids, and you're able to utilize them whenever each one is needed. For example, let's say you're, you've adjusted and your uh, uh, anaerobic threshold is at 80%. Uh, after 80%, when you're doing, uh, uh, let's say, some max lifts and stuff like that, then you're going to need some carbs to provide the ATP because you don't need, there's not enough oxygen to do what you need to do as far as the Krebs cycle. Um, then your ability to use the glycogen through glycolysis and and form lactic acid as, as an end product, which then again goes into glucose, uh, will, will be enhanced. Um, you'll be able to use more fat for a higher level of exertion. And when you need the highest level of exertion, where you need the carbs to produce the ATP because of lack of oxygen, then you'll have that ability because uh, that's where the carb phase comes in. This is why they're called phase fifth diets. It allows you to use both substrates 
utilizing fat as a primary fuel for most of it and using the carbs, which are still, and this is the carb up phase where the glycogen, the granules, uh, accumulate in the muscle cells, which will provide you with the ability for the anaerobic aspect of uh, performance. So how long do the carbs really, like, like once you do your, let's say you do a 24-hour carb refeed and you're kind of, you know, six days keto, one day carb refeed, uh, at which point, like, you know, obviously the, the, the glycogen in the cell, the carb refeed, at which point is that you're going to get a tailor off? I mean, is it a two, three, four day, or is that really dependent on, you know, I mean, obviously training on training volume. So uh, if somebody's training at a pretty high intensity, two workouts a day, I mean, opposed from somebody that's like, hey, I only train three days a week. So is it something, you know, I mean, I guess, yeah, no, basically back in the individual. I think it will vary according to the person themselves, uh, how long they've been on it. Um, their ability, again, going back to this hard wiring and soft wiring, which is a genetic aspect, you know, certain things will be muted, other things will be enhanced. Um, it, it's going to be a personal thing. This is why, you know, I push through all the books and everything that I say that you have to experiment. And, of course, it's the same thing with training. You have to experiment. You have to learn. Um, you get a chance to do that, do that every week, actually. So you might find, for example, that uh, you're doing great. You've gone through the three months. Uh, you've been carb loading for uh, maybe uh, two days and you find that uh, you're not at the level where you want to be as far as body composition, maybe even performance, then start cutting back, you know, carb up this one day, carb up one meal. Sure. That one meal will super compensate you and will increase the glycogen levels in your muscle cells and the liver. Um, and that may be all you need. What would you, okay, so uh, let's take it to a fun uh, place. If you could say, all right, you know what, you've been six days on the diet, uh, you wake up in the morning and, you know, maybe go over and, you know, work out a little bit, and you come back and you're going to do your monster refeed, what is your carb of choice? What would be your weapon of choice if you were going to sit down and you could eat anything? What do you think it is? Well, there's, <laughs> you know, I, again, again, we get into the, when I was talking about fast and slow proteins, it's fast and slow carbs, too. Certain carbs that uh, will enter your body very fast, and uh, you know, sugar, for example, dextrose, and uh, the, uh, the the actual building up of, of glycogen will be very fast. If in fact uh, you want it to last longer, you can, uh, and you, you choose more starchy foods, foods that don't digest as, as rapidly, don't increase insulin levels as much. So again, it's a matter of seeing uh, what kind of carbs work best for you. You might want to try, for example, uh, uh, maple syrup, uh, pancakes, uh, and, uh, you know, a pound of sugar. I mean, <laughs> just, just make it. I, uh, mine is, uh, mine's like, uh, I, so, so just a personal antidote, but, uh, so when I first went on this diet, <laughs> I think I was, you know, I was keto for, you know, the 12 days, and I did the carb refeed, and I didn't notice it, and about three or four weeks into, or three or four cycles into it, which I guess would have been about three or four or five weeks into it, all of a sudden, I had been keto for, you know, whatever, that Sunday, that six days, and I got up on that Saturday morning, and I remember I went to go eat breakfast, and I sat down, and I think I ate something like, you know, 24 pancakes and a waffle and, like, a bowl of fruit, and I'm pretty sure I could have eaten every single thing at that restaurant. And I remember uh, years later talking to uh, Tom Inkledon, and when Inkledon was in college, he had had a similar, or when he was doing his, his grad work at Penn State, similar deal. They were on the keto stuff and had been testing the anabolic diet, and he said he sat down and ate like 12 pounds of pasta at one meal and uh, literally could have keep eating. So it's, it's kind of interesting because you reach that state and all of a sudden that carb refeed and you just start eating carbs, and there is no way that you're ever going to feel full off it. And so like mentally you kind of have to like, you know, after eating these kind of higher protein, higher fat diets where you get full and you kind of stay full longer, all of a sudden you eat these carbs and like you're like, dude, I could eat every single uh, pancake in the world right now and not even be full. So it was kind of a interesting deal and I had to realize, I was like, dude, the last thing I need to do is sit down and consume 3,000 grams of carbohydrates. The biggest mistake people make when they first start to diet, they go through the 12 days and then for two days they're eating like uh, 8,000 calories a day of straight carbs. <laughs> yeah, that was us. <laughs> Which actually worked pretty good. I mean, dude, I, I put on, you know, 25, 30 pounds of, uh, of muscle when I leaned out. All of a sudden, I was like, yeah, but you, you know, 300 pounds. Yeah, but it, like when I leaned out to 300, <laughs> I was fucking 8% body fat and was fucking jacked. And I was like, yeah. Could you imagine seeing like a 150 pound person trying to do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's. Yeah, I went, I went up to 212 pounds. You know, I'm only 5'6. 
And, no, uh, so how, about, how about anecdotally, after one of your legendary uh, four-hour sessions, what would be your, like, what would you, your refeed look like? I mean, so John's talking about 20 pancakes and a waffle over here. What, what about your carb of choice? Well, again, I wouldn't carb up immediately anyways, um, but my calorie intake probably uh, within the first hour would be, oh, well, I'd say the first two hours, because at first, uh, you know, I, I was almost always a bit nauseous. After the after the workout, um, sure. But then uh, two, maybe three, even three hour period, I would take in three, four thousand calories, um, mostly with protein. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I got past that, I would take probably another three thousand in the next four hours of uh, introducing carbs and stuff. So that day, I would probably take in. I went up to twelve thousand calories a day at times. Twelve thousand? Yeah, I said twelve. I, I I was eating like six to eight thousand calories, mm -hmm. and the only the the funnier part is when I was eating six and eight thousand calories, I was the leanest. When I started eating like three or four thousand calories, all of a sudden my body fat went up, and I remember having to eat that much and being like, "Fuck!" Like it's not that bad if you're eating like you know three, four hundred grams of protein and the fat, and it's fairly easy to get. But when you start talking about eating like eight thousand calories of nothing but carbohydrate, yeah, carby. <laughs> yeah, you're basically carby, and uh, you're a carby girl in a carby world. Like you know, you're basically mainlining uh, uh, what is it, dipping dots or something, you know? Well, you can get your you can get your calories level up a quart of olive oil. Yeah, I'm telling yeah. you, uh, one ounce shot glass of olive oil. You just bang yeah. that thing back and look around the restaurant. People give you this horrified look. You're like, what? Wow, it's monounsaturated fats. It's good. Well, that, that's a good sign when people give you this horrified look. They almost you know, <laughs> doing it right. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't understand. Well, the. Uh, uh, I got a quick question if I can interject. Uh, just on the a keto, we had a guest uh, a while back who talked about he had cancer and he applied a ketogenic diet and then I think within a matter of weeks his cancer had cleared up. Have you seen any other experiences like that before? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's there's a there's an effect on that. Cancer cells have have a defect in which they use uh, the glycolytic response, which means taking sugar breaking it down into pyruvate lactic acid and they get a lot of their energy even though even though it's very inefficient from that response so if you cut out the glycogen and the sugar and the carbs it's essentially starving itself because it can't go through the Krebs cycle process and oxidative phosphorylation to make the large amounts of ATP so some cancers yet yeah, definitely will uh, um, th this was discovered almost 40 years ago that, uh, that, that this happened. And um, Tex, uh, tell them who our guest was. Uh, Fred Hatfield. Oh Maybe yeah. Doctor Squad on. Yeah, I know Fred. He's a good guy. Yeah. So uh, Fred was, uh, you know, squatted his thousand plus uh, in uh, George Angus's marathon wraps and suit, and, and I, I, you know, George started training me in his garage when I was fourteen. So you know, he always talked about Doctor Squat and Fred Hatfield. So we reached out to him. We had him on the podcast, and he was awesome. So. I figured you guys are, you know, you you would know them as you guys travel in the same circles. Yeah, the only interesting thing is when I lifted, I didn't use anything except the belt and uh, knee wraps. I never used the super suits or the bench or any of that kind of stuff. You know, when you look at, you know, I, I'm waiting for the time when they're going to use bionics, and um, uh, that'll do all the lifting. It, it it gets ridiculous. I've always been against using a lot of uh, paraphernalia. Uh, you know, the the uh, uh, triple or quadruple bench press shirts for the guys, you know, bench, benching 900 pounds. You take all that away from them, maybe you can bench 500. You know, you know so, we, uh, I, I had a deal when I was out at Westside, uh, went out there and trained with Louie for uh, a, a time. Uh, we were doing floor, doing floor press, and I floor pressed right around 500, and so that was about, you know, right around uh, pretty close to what some of the other guys were hitting, and then they, uh, when we went over the next week and they threw on their shirts, these guys were benching, you know, 900, 970 pounds, and I remember thinking, like, dude, that shirt gives you a lot of carryover if you're able to, you know, raw bench in the in the mid fives, you know, f you know, because a 600 pound raw bench is, you know, what there's only a handful of people in the world. I mean, Cass, I think, still has got the biggest one at what, like 661, or I think that Eric Spato guy just beat that. But I mean, Cass, you know, held that record for a long time. So, um, but uh, you know, there's been a huge resurgence in raw lifting, and almost I think it got like the the suits and the wraps and the multiply. Got you know the guys got you know four meter uh, knee wraps and you know these canvas suits and a lot of this. I think people just kind of 
got a, either a little fed up or it just got almost too comical. And now, I mean, I just watched a video of uh, Eric Lillibridge on Instagram squatting 1,001 uh, for a double in a set of knee wraps. And he's a uh, you know, 290-pound guy. So, I mean, wow. now, now now you're seeing raw lifters actually approaching a lot of the numbers that you're seeing the multi-geared guys. So it kind of goes back to show you, like, you know, the raw lifting, what the body can do. I don't think people necessarily have any idea what the untapped potential can be. No, I agree. I agree 100%. You know, the, uh, I've, I've seen guys that uh, that actually uh, were really, really strong. I mean, uh, Tom Campbell, for example, I mean, he uh, won the world championships in 79. Uh, he was a training buddy. And, uh, you know, he just uh, didn't use any paraphernalia. And, and the guy was in the 198 pound class at the time. He uh, took six months off training completely, came back, and he benched 450. You know, without 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 a pause. You know, I mean, it's just just ridiculous. These guys, these guys are just built uh, hard wires, and uh, then you add all the other paraphernalia to maximize their hard wiring. Um, so I don't know. It's uh, it's tricky. I don't know the paraphernalia. I've always been against it. I was vice president of the uh, International Powerlifting Federation, and uh, also the uh, president of the Pan American Powerlifting Federation. And I quit both because it was just getting out of hand. You know, they were using triple ply stuff. And I thought, you know, where's the strength in this? I, I, I want to see what a person can do on their own, not what the equipment can do. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's, uh, it's been pretty cool. I mean, I think the resurgence in raw lifting is, uh, you know, it's going to really help the sport of powerlifting. I think because people can identify with it. And you see a guy wearing, you know, uh, multiply briefs, canvas suits, and this whole deal, they wrap themselves up like a rubber band. And I think people have a hard time. What's that? How about the bench shirts? They look like they're freaks. Their arms are yeah. their arms are crossed in front of them. And they can't move unless they have a weight. Yeah. yeah. No, it's. I mean, what's a kind of a trip is uh, you can really kind of gauge somebody's strength because you know really the there, there's no suit that's really going to help on the deadlift. So I mean, you can kind of take a look and you know see kind of like you know a guy comes in and he squats a grand and you know benches. You know, 800 pounds, but he only deadlifts like 600 pounds. You're kind of like, oh, well, how strong is that dude really, or how much is that on the gear? But then all of a sudden, you see a guy come in, and you know, you know, now you got these guys squatting a thousand plus raw, and they're pulling, you know, eight, nine hundred pounds raw, and then they're getting an adventure, you know, five fifty, six hundred. I mean, that to me is a strong dude. I mean, that's that's the most impressive stuff I've ever seen. Well, I did I did 722 in in the bench in the uh, deadlift, sorry, uh, using uh, belt and. Uh, Wraps. That's it. Actually, I don't even think I wore wraps. I don't even think I wore knee knee wraps. Right. Did Did you pull conventional or were you a sumo guy? Uh, conventional most of the time. Uh, I switched over to sumo for a while, and then went back to conventional. So I I I, I deadlift actually because of my my structure, uh, shorter back. Um, I I do I do well with either way. The guys with the longer backs uh, that are good, especially good in squats. They do better usually with sumo because they can duplicate the squat effect and they don't have to uh, bend over as much. Sure. Yeah. No. The the sumo is a short stroke, especially if you're kind of a long torso, kind of short leg. You get those legs real wide, and you know you got to pull it three or four inches. So, um, what uh, you know, uh, geez, I feel like uh, uh, we're run or not not running out, but this thing could go down the rabbit hole anyway. <laughs> is there anything that uh, you know? You really think like uh, you know that's burning on your mind, and you're like you know this is a little bit of knowledge you really want to impart. Well, it's it's I, I guess I guess the main thing that, uh, that discourages me um, is, is the way things are presented. You know, this, the science the science uh, studies uh, they're, they're taken out of context. They're they're you know made into entertainment, uh, and I mentioned this before. Uh, that that disturbs me. I think more than anything, it's almost like false advertising. I mean, uh, the context that you know, the basics. And I read some of the stuff on your site, and it, it's pretty good because you know you're looking at you're looking at the basics. You know, you have to, you have to train a certain extent. You have to eat right. You have to do this right. It's not going to be all one thing. I think what discourages me most uh, most of all of this is the advertising for nutritional supplements. I mean. I can't believe. Uh, I, I'm ashamed, actually, sometimes to be in the nutrition supplement business when I see some of these false advertisements. 
and that kind of stuff. So that 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 is a pet peeve. And you're not talking about T Nation, are you? Sorry. You're not talking about T Nation, are you? No, no. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of them, though. I mean, oh I mean, man. Look at the magazines. I mean, they're just they're just ridiculous. You see these guys who are obviously on every kind of hormone, anabolic growth hormone in the world, and it's because of this certain supplement that that's the way they are. I mean, what kind of bullshit is this? You know, um, that's been going on for a long time, but it's getting worse. And advertise. I, I I won't watch TV if it's got advertisement because first of all, you know, I'm watching something, and then the advertisement comes, and I can't think. I can't I can't remember what the hell I was watching. You know. Five minutes of advertising in between. Um, also, advertising is getting to the point where I don't know if there's one that isn't lying, you know, or saying something which is totally exaggerated. Sure, you got to sell your product. I agree with that. Okay, but let's keep it on a level where it's still on Earth rather than uh, out in outer space. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's I'm right there that, with you, uh, Doc. The the bigger the lie, the easier it is to believe. I mean, that's like the standard deal. Like, uh, you know, people don't believe, believe little lies. People believe these kind of fantastic, massive lies. And you open up your bodybuilding magazine, and you're like, oh yeah, that guy is three uh, percent body fat at you know 295 pounds at 510. And oh yeah, I take his weight gainer supplement. And you're like, really? That's you know, like I mean, you know, like you said, at least be honest about it. But you know, I mean, uh, it's it's playing into this idea that you know, you can attain this, and, you know, like Teenage is a great example. I mean, uh, you know, that whole site is really dedicated around biotest and really selling supplements and everything kind of trails back to it, you know, and they put out, a, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of conflicting stuff. I mean, you know, when you, you know, obviously I haven't, haven't been doing this as long as you have, but haven't played at a high level and trained with a lot of people, I mean, there's really, you know, some clear defined paths and really the thing which, you know, we talk about and really why we started where I started power athlete was this idea that you know what like strip away the bullshit like you got to do a little bit more today than you did yesterday you got to eat clean you got to sleep uh, or I mean more importantly uh, you know like is eating clean now such a, a you know a random uh, you know term but like you know eat consistently eat the right foods and uh, you know go in and train and rinse and repeat and and be be consistent about it have a goal and you know stick to this methodology and you know, have a good training system and a good you know deal in place. I mean, you got to run, you got to sprint, you got to jump. I agree. You know, I'm waiting for the advertisement where this uh, obviously huge dude pulls up a bottle and it says "bottle of crap." I take this. And it's giving me all these results. Plus, and then the little disclaimer at the bottom: plus a thousand milligrams of testosterone a day, 500 milligrams of so and so. You know, uh, 16 units of GH, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know. Well, I, I I think you're underestimating some of the amounts. I mean, I, I think uh, I, I was I was talking to a guy who uh, you know he was kind of in the know with some of the stuff recently, and he was uh, he's like you know was talking about you know this guy and this guy and made the comment like three grams, and I was like three grams of what? And he's like, oh, that's kind of a you know these guys are doing two or three grams of testosterone a week, and I'm like two or three no, grams. No, I'm, talking a day. I'm talking about a thousand milligrams a day. Oh Jesus! I'll tell you something. Back in the 70s, when I was most competitive, I <laughs> I saw I saw some people at the dinner table take a bottle of Danabol, 100 tablets, five milligrams, and chew the whole bottle. And they did that twice a day, plus their injectables, et cetera, et cetera. Oh okay, and I'm not going to name names, obviously, but I mean, and then and then there's an advertisement saying I use a bottle of crap. I remember a story Zangus told me about some guys. Uh, they used to do. Uh, they would get every pill they could find. They would dump it into a bag, mix it all up, and dump it on a bed. And then they put their hands behind, and they would just gobble up all the pills. Yeah. And uh, the guy, you know, and some guys would take two bites, but they just kind of get everything. And he was, uh, you know, George was, you know, Thompson powerlifting coach and worked with a, you know, a lot of high lifters, and so he was. He was pretty, uh, you know, forthright one. I was pretty young in uh, in the game about it, and the guys would come over and train, and you know, you see the guy with you know squatting eight, nine, hundred pounds, and I remember, you know, as a bright-eyed fourteen, fifteen-year-old kid, being like kind of amazed, and George was always real good about being like, hey, like, like let's not make any illusions about what's happening here. I mean, it's a strength game, and these are the tools. I mean, much like uh, wrist wraps and knee wraps, and these are the tools in the game, and 
you know, and the decisions guys makes. But uh, no, I mean, I, I remember years ago when I, I think I asked you or I read the book about, you know, why you, you know, really, uh, you know, first put together the anabolic diet. And it was like, hey, I want to give people, uh, you know, a chance to be able to use the most powerful anabolic substance in the world, which is food and insulin, for, you know, strength and, and body can or uh, body composition without them having to use those drugs. Have you have you still found that to be the case? Oh, definitely. No doubt about it. I mean, that uh, the kind of diet actually optimizes a lot of the uh, growth hormones, a lot of the uh, cytokines that are uh, beneficial, a lot of the uh, factors, growth factors, and stuff. This is what you want to do. You want to optimize. You want to optimize that hard wiring so that you get the maximum amount of uh, anabolic body composition and performance that you can out of your own genetic structure. Uh, and and you you know people say. This whole thing, you know, and, and you know, I, I don't want to cut up other diets because all diets have their use, you know, and consistency, etc., is important. Um, but, but you got to be careful of diets that say, well, we've been eating this way for twenty thousand years, and this is the way that we're going to function best because this is the way we're built, and, and you know, we don't change that much. But in fact, you can change in seconds, and your body methylates and changes your genetic structure in a, in a snap of a finger. Um, uh, it may not be major changes, maybe minor changes, but some can be major. This is the whole basis behind the, uh, the phase shift dieting: is that you basically change your phenotype, uh, your your, your uh, um, the way you actually the genes you're actually using for the purpose that you want to use them for, and knocking out the ones that are counterproductive. This is the whole basis behind uh, the hard wiring and what I call soft wiring, which is your epigenetic changes. Well, you know, the, the, the thing which we've seen at least most with like kind of, a, you know, that more primal paleo approach is actually people, uh, it, even though like, you know, and, and I've said it numerous times, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of that science because unfortunately we don't know anybody that's 20, 40,000 years old. We only can make observations. But the thing which is, is really been good about it is it's uh, forcing people to eat real foods and yeah. like eat for, for more food quality. So... Um, if anything, you know, people can talk about the science and whatnot, but at the end of the day, man, like, uh, you know, one one ingredient, eat real foods, like that type of kind of, uh, you know, that approach and that idea that, you know, the paleo kind of primal stuff I think has done has been worlds of difference with this idea that, like, you know, nobody got strung out of eating out of a vending machine and, like, you know, if it's a, a hark back to, to, to more basic days, I'm, I'm all for it, so. Um, I, unfortunately, we're, 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 under under the thumb of a lot of things, you know, we have a lot of pollutants, we have a lot of uh, a lot of substances in the uh, in our system, in our food, in, the, in our water, in our air that are estrogenic, for example, substances that are toxic. We have antibiotics in our in our water unless you have something that, you know, if you want to live optimally, you want to make sure your water is pure, your your food is pure, uh, you know, the the uh, knowing where your food comes from, ideally. You could do it, but it takes a lot of time and energy to find out somebody who's not using all kinds of chemicals, antibiotics, etc., to produce chicken or, or beef or whatever, uh, and also uh, water that, that's pure, that's put through reverse osmosis and, and delivers outside of a plastic container, etc. You got to look at all these substances. These are all uh, things that change your your hormonal profile and also have changes on your on your genetic structure that can be counterproductive. So. Yeah, you're right. Eating whole foods, eating as healthy as you can, using whatever information we have right now, and keeping away from things that we know are coming out to be toxic, etc. What about uh, you know? Obviously, the you know you put this diet together in terms of that, but what about uh, and I'm sure you always get this question. What about people that eat this way that were using massive amounts of anabolic drugs? Well, you know, you can have you can have all the estrogen you want from uh, from plastics from. Uh, Various uh, manufacturing processes, even eating and everything. But if you're taking an anti-estrogen like uh, exemestine, uh, uh, comifene, uh, tamoxifen, etc., you're nullifying a lot of these uh, negative effects from the uh, environmental estrogens. So yeah, taking. I mean, let's face it. Uh, athletes and bodybuilders, they don't just use one drug. They, you know, for example, they don't use sonazolol because sonazolol doesn't aromatize and has more of a cutting effect. Uh, they'll use all kinds of different steroids, all kinds of factors and stuff, and then they'll mitigate the side effects of these factors by using other drugs. 
and the example I use would be the antiestrogens or the aromatase inhibitors that would be counteracting any of the estrogenic effects from your environment and from whatever else that you're using as far as steroids, etc. Awesome. They've got the cocktail. Yeah, well, hey, yeah. you know, you, you got to battle, but yeah, it's uh, uh, what's the uh, in, in terms of you know, and I know you've coached bodybuilders and, and different people uh, in terms of body composition. Have you uh, what's the you know leanest or you know like who like, like who have you worked with that would kind of be like, hey, this would be my poster child. I mean, obviously Bob Sapp, who is one of the largest humans on the planet, followed this for years and looks the way he does because of you guys want to Google, Google Bob, but uh, you know, like yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, you may go back a few years. You know, go back to the 50s and 60s of bodybuilding. Uh, anabolic steroids, testosterone, et cetera, as far as I'm concerned, was used back in the late 1930s, as early as that, uh, when it was first synthesized and then used. Uh, there was a couple of papers on uh, using it for uh, people who have lost weight. Uh, what we know as sarcopenia today, for example, uh, uh, loss of muscle mass because of cancer, et cetera. Um, and then the 40s it was used. You know, of course, the uh, the story about the Nazis using the uh, uh, sure. steroids at the, uh, at the Olympics in the late 30s. Um, so this stuff's been used for a long time, but if you take the 50s bodybuilders, like, for example, Dave Draper, Ron Bomber, yep. um, I think you can maintain, you, you can get that kind of physique. And, and this goes back to Sandow, even, you know. I mean, at that time, they had no, he, he was natural. Uh, he never did much in bench press, so there's only lack as far as I was concerned was his chest area. But uh, take Dave Draper, I think you can reach that kind of level of bodybuilding, that kind of level of body composition um, by natural means, by using your diet and, and everything else. Um, beyond that, I think you're using substances. Well, Dave Draper looked pretty good. I mean, I, uh, we, you know, I've definitely seen some some pictures of him compared to Arnold, who obviously, you know, was was you know using probably, you know, more or less at the time. But yeah, Dave Draper. I mean, if you guys ever look at him, I mean, he still has a, a pretty good sight, and I mean, he was you know as uh, as big and as star as Arnold was at the time. And I mean, there's a bunch of training stuff with him and Arnold. You can see, so he was definitely a pumping iron. So if you guys do a search on him, I mean, he was a pretty stout guy. Yeah, he was, yeah, and he still is, actually. Still. Yeah, he still looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah he, he's got a sight, and he's pretty active on his forearms. I mean, it's, uh, uh, but yeah, if you can, you know, uh, you know, and I think he makes furniture. I think he's, I think that's what his job, or that, that his hobby is, he's like a furniture maker, or that's what he came with as trade. He is, he's, he's a good guy, though. I like him. Nice. But, uh, you know, I mean, that's the type of physique that uh, I think can be attained, uh, following the right guidelines, you know, the right diet, the right uh, Right, even the right supplements, etc. Supplements, as you mentioned earlier, they're supplements. Nutritional supplements are supplements. They'll add on top of what you're doing correctly. Your training is right. You're, you know, it, it, it's like a pipeline. Okay, um, you've got your training, your diet, and then at the end of the pipeline, to give you that little lecture, you've got the nutritional supplements. But you don't start off by screwing up your diet and training half-assed and uh, take a whole bunch of supplements and expect to get anywhere. Yeah, but that's kind of the, uh, the the modern kind of idea that, you know, like, it, it's crazy. I mean, before people ask me, I mean, we teach seminars, one of the biggest questions, you know, is never about the diet, it's never about the training. It's like, what supplements? And I'm always like, well, by nature, a supplement is a supplement. <laughs> so it's a secondary deal that, you know, and there's no way to out-supplement a, a shitty diet. There's no way to out-supplement a bad sleep pattern. And there's even less way to, uh, you know, out-supplement a bad training program. So... I mean, it's kind of like I'm just amazed that people get so kind of worked up, and that's really the, the the biggest you know deal. I'm sure you get hit with it all the time, and you're like, well, before we start talking about supplements, let's talk about the basics. Let's talk about the the primaries. Well, I do that actually. I have I have I do supplement regimens for people who have their act straight as far as their training and their, uh, their diet, and their, uh, their lifestyle. The lifestyle is part of this, uh, uh, this whole process. You know, you're not gonna you know get drunk every night and, uh, you know, get three hours sleep, uh, et cetera, and, and then try and get everything else in line. You're just not going to do it, okay? They all have to be, they all have to be working together. Um, I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of Olympic athletes, et cetera, that I've, that I've made uh, personalized supplement uh, regimens for, uh, even CrossFit athletes. Uh, if you go on my site, uh, the new site, it's not really ready yet, but it's got a lot of information on it. It's uh, www moral m-a-u-r-o-m-d.com look at the uh, uh, 
under the uh, uh, information tag. Uh, there's a lot of articles there, and, and there's a lot of uh, uh, ideas on how to take supplements. And, you know, a lot, a lot on the diet, and a lot of uh, some on training as well. But we're working on that. No, I'm glad to see that the new site's up. I remember, or this new site. I remember the old one. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's amazing how far how everything comes. It looks good. So. Um, no, Doc. Hey, I'm 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 stoked that uh, we got to finally get on, and uh, that way, uh, hopefully, that was a, a wealth of knowledge that people can go through and piece some stuff back. And uh, if any, and then what we'll do is we'll link you up and hopefully drive some traffic your way. And um, if people are interested in getting in touch with Mario, you can you can contact them through the website and uh, go from there. If I can mention it on, on MoroMD.com, there's a if you want to join the newsletter, uh, it'll be coming out uh, next two or three weeks. Uh, it'll be an information newsletter. I hope that people like it. I used to put one out quite a while ago. I've actually put newsletters there for the last 30 years. Yeah, um, I know. I'm, I've been getting them, but I remember when you sent me the email about a year ago that you were going to start the newsletter up. I think I emailed you, and I was like, "Great!" I, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, I was like, "I was like, finally, thank God!" You know, because uh, it's been it's been great stuff. Yeah, I started newsletters back in the early 80s. Well, so, been a while. So anything besides the newsletter and the site, more? Is there anything else you want to plug or promote to our followers? No, no, not really. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that uh, I don't advertise. Uh, you know, marketing is uh, is minimal. Um, I try and put out a good product, best I can. The formulations over the years, I've learned a lot. Try to make things work synergistically. Try to make them healthy. I don't, you know. Uh, physician code do no harm so I don't want my products to hurt anybody uh, it's uh, I'm just coming out with uh, I've just done redone five formulations what I do is I use the I use the, uh, the computer model I have uh, Testa boost Testa boost uh, version 1 version 2 version 3 and as I improve the the, uh, the, the basic uh, formulation uh, I come out with a new version so it's like uh, Microsoft Office you know or Microsoft uh, uh, anything Version one, two, two point one. I don't use the point ones. I just go from great versions. But there's a bunch of new versions that will be coming out in the next three or four months. Awesome, Very cool. All right, well, uh, well, thanks, uh, Doc. If uh, you can stay on the line, if you want, we're just going to uh, cover a couple oh. things on our end about one of our charities. So, yeah, yeah. So, but we, if not, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, we, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Doc. We we started a charity a couple years ago uh, to support, uh, or in memory of a little boy named Wade Brune. And uh, yes, we, I saw uh, that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, he lost his fight with a neuroblastoma. Um, you know, when he was, I think he, he first was afflicted with it when he was about a little over a year, and he fought it off, and then it came back a second time. And he ended up losing his fight, and he was the uh, little boy of uh, Heather and Scott De Bruin, who Heather and my wife grew up together. And I remember at the time when he was going through his fight, uh, my wife was pregnant with twins, and um, he was a twin, so it kind of hit us pretty deep. And then. Uh, about you know a year coming in after he passed, um, you know my wife asked us for something we can do, and so we started uh, Wade's Army um, to raise money for this uh, you know terrible terrible pediatric cancer that starts in the nerve cells and really affects uh, you know takes way too many little kids and only affects kids under the age of two. So uh, last year we raised a pretty good amount of dough, and we actually just hit our mark and we were able to raise sixty thousand dollars. And part of that money goes to cancer research, and then the other part goes to funding and helping the families of these kids, because there's only six places that uh, actually treat kids for neuroblastoma, and so these parents drive from all over, sleep in their cars, and we wanted a way to be able to go out and, you know, offset their expenses and help them, and, you know, I mean, because, you know, when your kid's in trouble, you'll do whatever, so it's uh, it's been great, and, yeah, we raise money, and um, it's uh, it's been pretty awesome to see the people that are listening to this podcast and the people that are, you know, followers of uh, Power Athlete and our, and, and our whole deal really rally, and is pretty amazing. So um, it's, a, it's a great cause, and uh, yeah, we, we reached our goal. So we still got 23 more days, and uh, yeah, our, our shirts are getting printed, and we'll be sending those out. And we kind of started it with like a T-shirt drive, the idea that you know every army needs a uniform. So it's been pretty great. Well, you know, they're making a lot of progress. You know, monoclonal antibodies now with uh, being tissue specific might be well used for neuroblastoma in the future. Um, I've seen some amazing results. Uh, with people with for example, there was a, a man with uh, tongue cancer where they had to take out his tongue and uh, part of his teeth and jaw. They put him on this monoclonal, new monoclonal antibody, uh, and the tumor, which was about the size of a baseball, shrunk down to almost nothing in uh, less than two weeks. 
Wow. I um we uh, I just got a, an email from my wife. She has uh, another childhood friend she grew up with that has a terribly autistic little boy, who's been in and out of the hospital for you know uh, you know for years and you know is like you know stuck at about age you know 18 months and he's probably five or six years old and uh, my wife just finally talking to her about you know you know kind of getting back to that kind of holistic kind of you know whole food diet kind of that paleo SDO kind of gluten free and even you know kind of really you know monitoring the carbs and. Uh, I, we got an, you know we got an email the other day that um, you know for the first time you know they went to the pumpkin patch he didn't you know have a meltdown and he's sleeping better and he's not having as many uh, outbursts and is actually um, you know increasing his intelligence and really working and it just goes to show you that uh, you know just you know small things like somebody might listen to this podcast or somebody might listen to this and next thing you know you're able to to help somebody and then you know next thing you know it all kind of pays forward and so yeah it's it's been uh, it's been really really rewarding and. Uh, we're stoked uh, to have been able to do this. So hopefully, it gives some money to research, and we can help kind of fight this deal a little bit. Maybe hey, that's great. Fantastic. Right. All right, Doc. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I'm sure I'll be I'll, I'll hit you up as soon as I get off this, and uh, hit you up for any of the uh, uh, articles you recommended and uh, any of the papers, and I'll post them up on the site and give a link and uh, let people get a hold of you, and we'll go from there. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks for everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking the time. Talk to you later, Doc. Thanks, Doc. All right, bye-bye.